Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of SIF Virtual. Today, we have a great panel to discuss high-risk PCI. This is a panel that uh, we've all become very good friends, and uh, we refer to uh, our group as Squad 2. So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, joined by this uh, group of esteemed cardiologists. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jim Hermiller. Jim, would you mind being our moderator today? No, that would be great. Thanks, Dave. This is going to be, I, I think, a, just a fantastic session. We've got uh, such a collection of great talent here. So um, I'm sure this is going to be very interesting. We can't wait to see what you have, Dave. Jim, uh, with us on SIF Virtual today, we have Ron Caputo, Steve Yakubov, David Cox, Sunil Rao, Louis Cannon, and Tom Stuckey. Uh, for several of them, it's kind of a return visit to Scottsdale Interventional Forum. Uh, but this is the... Uh, this is the kickoff for Ron Caputo. So Ron, welcome to the SIF family. Thank you for having me. All right, Herms, I'll get right into it. Um, All right, great. I have a case of what I call the high risk elective PCI. And I thought we could discuss, you know, whether or not this was a surgical case versus a catheter based case and the use of uh, hemodynamic uh, support or mechanical circulatory support. Um, this is a an 81-year-old female with a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and peripheral vascular disease. She also had a recent admission for congestive heart failure. Uh, she has documented advanced obstructive and restrictive lung disease. She had a GI bleed in 1989, but has had no recurrences. It was actually a fairly significant bleed, however. She had been on non agents at that time. She presented to our clinic with severe dyspnea and protracted angina with minimal effort. Echocardiography was performed, which showed a 35% ejection fraction with global hypokinesis. Uh, amongst the relevant laboratory data is uh, a creatinine of 1.3, and you can see here she has a reduced GFR. Uh, so at this point, uh, because of her clinical presentation, we decided on uh, coronary angiography. Uh, cardiac catheterization, you can see in the right coronary, not much that stimulates the oculostenotic reflex. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, the uh, lesion at the uh, bifurcation of the left main LAD and left circumflex speaks for itself. Herms, any comments on that or? Yeah, so um, let's just, I'm gonna send it right over to Ron's, it's his, his uh, maiden voyage here. So let's talk about, first we'll talk about um, revascularization, PCI versus uh, cabbage. Why don't you just weigh in on that? Well, I think um, obviously with that history, her risk for bypass surgery is going to be really high. I don't know what her STS score is, but uh, that's already sort of giving you a flavor about which direction uh, we might want to go, uh, at least right off the bat. I mean, you know, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the data that we've seen from Excel and so forth gives us some really good information that, that stenting uh, unprotected left main is, is a very reasonable strategy. And um, certainly it's been done now for many, many years. So very comfortable with that. And then anatomically, uh, you know, this is a situation where you've got a distal severe, I mean, complex distal left main stenosis, very high grade and, and definitely big time involved in the circumflex, which appears to be reasonably large. So, um, you know, it's a huge amount of territory at risk and I didn't see a lot of collateral flow from the right. So this is a case where I would think about a um, couple things with her low ejection fracture and other risks, I think hemodynamic, hemodynamic support uh, uh, right off the bat, uh, would probably be a good strategy. And then in terms of revascularization, I think we're headed toward PCI and I would probably, I think this is definitely a two stent approach. All right. Okay. That's good. I, uh, I, I think that's a great summary. I, uh, uh, Dave Cox, anything else you'd add to that uh, wonderful summary? Yeah, I, I really think, you know, we often talk about bypass surgery, these lung patients, just do terrible and they may not die, but they just have this incredibly sad and complex hospital course. 
I guess, Ron, the, the only question I might have for you is we know she has peripheral vascular disease. What does that make you think about in terms of mechanical support? Right. Well, that's obviously a huge consideration. Uh, you know, she's 81. She's, it's a woman. Uh, I don't know if she, you know, if she's a, a, one of those little tiny old ladies that we run into all the time, but I think it's often, you know, this is, is an elective procedure and, and that does give us the ability to image her, her uh, iliacs and femorals if that's, if that's a concern. Uh, and for sure, in, in these patients, that's where you're going to run into trouble is, is it, you, nine times out of 10. If you're going to run into trouble, it's with vascular access. Yeah. Um, so, Neil, what do you think? Yeah, so a couple of things here. I, I think there's some additional data that would probably help us here. I would do a right heart cath in this lady. Um, I think given the lung disease and the low ejection fraction, it's going to be important for us to know uh, what her wedge pressure and her PA pressures are. Uh, I would do an abdominal aortogram to get a sense of what the iliacs and SFAs look like. Um, and then obviously she's got mid LED disease. So not only does she have a 111 distal left main bifurcation, but she looks like she's got a, a 010 mid LED bifurcation as well with a gigantic diagonal. Um, I think, you know, look, I, I'm not a big user of hemodynamic support. I think this is the one case where, um, you know, you're, this is a case where it would obviously be, be beneficial. Um, you can talk about what you would choose, um, but I think the other thing you have to consider here is that you're probably going to have to do atherectomy just by angiography. There's so much calcification here, and you want to take your time when you're doing angiography. And you're, when you're doing angiography in the left, or when you do, I'm sorry, atherectomy, when you're doing atherectomy in the left main, it's beneficial to have uh, hemodynamic support because you want to take your time, do a good job. The runoff here is uh, is great. The big diagonal will absorb a lot of the particles going downstream, so I don't think you're going to run into trouble with no reflow. But I do think that additional pieces of information are going to be important. Yeah, I like that. And in the house, Louis Cannon. Louis, what do you think? Yeah, Herms, I, I, I agree with this distinguished panel. I, I think a couple of things that haven't been mentioned is the syntax score actually is relatively low on her. Uh, the ejection fraction really pushes you toward uh, thinking about mechanical support. If you were going to do an IMA to the LED, let's say this lady was insulin dependent diabetic. She didn't like the thought of possible restenosis, et cetera. Um, you know, you would really need to do a diagonal skip to the LED because just putting an IMA to the LED isn't going to do it here because you're going to lose the territory around the uh, diagonal one. So I, I would favor really what Sunil has said. I think we've got to get a feeling of uh, peripheral vascular disease, extent of disease. Can we get a mechanical support device there? Uh, I would use atherectomy and debulk this uh, left main and uh, circumflex and LED. And then I think eventually during the same procedure, if we can, I think I would tackle the mid LED as well to maximize the, uh, uh, the flow that goes uh, downstream here. So uh, I think this is a great case uh, for intervention and mechanical support. Um, so Tom Stucky, so tell us how you're going to handle that bifurcation. You're going to DK crush, you're going to cool out it. You're going to do something provisional and pray. Um, how are you going to handle it? Yeah, I, I don't think I would. Well, first of all, I, I, I would agree with everything that ever that has been said. Um, I think you do need to know what the status of the peripheral vasculature is. Um, once you, once you figure that out and if you've got good hemodynamic support, um, I, I actually would um, favor a two cent strategy. I mean, the nice thing about the coronary anatomy, even though it's highly calcified, you know, the, the vessel distal to the, uh, both the circumflex and the LED look fairly favorable, you know, for stenting. So, you know, I, uh, given the angle, the angle looks pretty, um, pretty steep. Um, there's some modest size difference. Um, so I probably would lean more towards a, uh, a uh, two stent strategy and and possibly and probably DK crush. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. And then uh, um, finally, uh, Steve Yakova, would you do this? Uh, um, I even hate to ask the question with Sunil in the house, femoral or radial, and uh, you know, <laughs> would you go six French or seven French? Um, this requires rotational atherectomy is, has been spoken about already. And there's a chance that this might require a two over that, that left main looks really big and you may not get this thing open well enough with just a one five burr. So I'd be prepared to go to 
a two over, which will require a seven French guide catheter. The, you can do this through the impella sheath. You know, if you're committed to using impella, as many of us would do in this case, you could put in the uh, impella sheath and put the seven French guide catheter in their sheath also. It's a little tight, but you could probably get it done with just one um, access to the femoral artery. That's what I would favor. The reason I would use impella is because, you know, you need to have a wire down the LED in the cirque, but for rotational atherectomy, you can only have one wire down to do that. And um, that's where impella really helps you. So that if you get into trouble with this, with one of those two arteries, the LED or the cirque, you should be protected until you can get out of trouble. You know, Herms, I mentioned the peripheral vascular disease. And oftentimes when you talk about peripheral vascular disease in this setting, even if uh, some of the uh, discussants aren't going to utilize upfront mechanical circulatory support, they will say in the setting of peripheral vascular disease, at least have access because you want to know that your uh, that your access is secure in case the patient starts to to to, to have problems or uh, destabilize during the course of the procedure. They don't want to be trying to get access. So everyone sort of said that they they were thinking about uh, MCS as an upfront strategy. Um, no one uh, uh, said I wouldn't use MCS, but I would get access. I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I I mean. To me, uh, my, my comment on support is, you know, when do you use it? It's sick anatomy and it's a sick heart. And on top of this, she's a sick patient. And, you know, you, you get that trifecta for me, that, that equals support. And you're going to do complex disease uh, with atherectomy. You know, that, that all equals support. So let me ask you, Sunil, would you ever do orbital versus rotational atherectomy here? Um, um, yeah, that's a great that. question. It's a great question. I mean, um, you know, we've, uh, our practice here, we've switched almost entirely over to orbital atherectomy. It's largely based on just the ease of use. Although Rotopro is very easy, easy to use as well. So I think it's either one is fine. I think um, it's whatever you're more comfortable with. I mean, uh, just for people who are watching this, who may not be aware of the differences, uh, you know, the orbital device is a, is a one size crown where you can get different luminal gain based on the RPMs. It ablates forward and backwards. Obviously, with rotational atherectomy, you have different size burrs uh, that tends to ablate forward. I think aerodoosteal, it's great to use rotational atherectomy. Here, I think it's whatever people are comfortable with. It's, it's dealer's choice, in my view. Okay. Yeah, I have a question for the panel. This, you know, we're, I, I think we're all in agreement that we need to debulk this, this lesion, but that's a pretty bad lesion and there's a severe angle leading into the cirque. I, I'm not sure you're going to, we'll find out, but I'm not sure that it's going to be easy to cross with either the Viper or a rotowire. It, this, this, you know, so this is, this could complicate things a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and actually, Ron, I was going to, the next question I was going to ask is which one of these are you going to debulk first, the cirque or the LED? Um, and that's always uh, sort of a, a question that comes up. What would you do? Which one would you go after first? I'd probably go after the LAD. Honestly, um, it's a huge territory. I mean, that that diagonal is massive. If that goes down, you're 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 going to have a lot of trouble. And even with hemodynamic support, I think I would I would try to get the LAD done first. As Steve mentioned, you know, you're you're only going to be able to put one wire in here. You're not going to be able to protect the circumflex. You're maybe considering uh, treating the LAD anyway, uh, the mid LAD. So I, I think I'd probably go for the LAD first. Do you know which, um, can you tell me, uh, uh, Dr. Isaac, uh, on that initial angiogram of the right, um, there was some evidence of collateralization. Can you, do you have an idea? We had limited views, but do you have an idea which vessel that went to? <laughs> You see it coming there. So yeah. I would call that an inconsequential artery it's going to. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Tom? Well, no, I, you know, I it can't completely tell there, but you know, one of the things that might influence is what, what you go after first. That's the only reason I make the point. Yeah. You know, yeah. In this, in this case, looking at the um, takeoff of the circ, 
it, you know, you're going to have more of a right angle bend. I think you're safer doing the LED straight away. Yeah. So that's where I would pass the wire. And if I had any concerns, I would just wire it with a, um, a micro catheter and then do the, the exchange for the rotoblader wire or um, whatever debulking system you're going to use and, and use, the, use that wire. Yeah, yeah, there is a technique to uh, there is a technique to protect a, a side branch wire if you're going to do atherectomy with anything other than laser. It's you need an eight French guide because you got to put a guide liner in to protect that side branch wire, and then you know uh, ablate into the vessel that you want to. But it, it gets it, it gets complicated. Um, uh, so and here I think that if you do debulk into the LED, my guess is that you're going to shave enough of that uh, plaque away that the circle probably hang in there. Yeah, I, I like that. The other thing I usually try and do is rotablate or atherectomize the easiest vessel that I'm less likely to make a mess of because I don't, what you don't want to do here is do the circ first. That to me looks like it may be a mess, easier mess that now you can't get to the LED because you, you know, you've closed things off. So I think you're going to be safe going into the LED. It's a straight shot, get that taken care of. As you said, Sunil, it may actually facilitate getting the wire into the circ and then do the atherectomy into the circ. That's what we thought too, uh, Herms. We thought it was a straighter shot into the LED. Herms, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So um, would each of you have run this by your surgeons, your heart team? And what would you have done if your surgeon said, I'll do surgery? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a reasonable, uh, abs absolutely reasonable discussion. I think given all her comorbidities, 81, you know, CKD, you know, three bad lungs, et cetera, et cetera, um, they would be happy for us to stent her. Well, so um, after coronary angiography, uh, this, uh, that's a good lead-in question, Dave. After coronary uh, angiography, our heart team convened and uh, two surgeons saw her and she was declined bypass surgery. And in their note, they put that advanced age, frailty, the advanced lung disease uh, were reasons enough uh, to, to, uh, to not do bypass and instead uh, tossed it back to the, uh, to the interventional cardiologist. Uh, so she was considered for complex PCI. You can see the syntax score of 21 and the associated uh, syntax two score. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my question is how do people use syntax and syntax two? We don't. A any, any comments? <laughs> Crickets chirping. <laughs> yeah, so we calculated, I think it's largely just uh, to, for educational purposes. I, I think it's, it's potentially helpful when um, you're uh, discussing sort of the complexity of the case with the patient. I mean, you're obviously not going to mention the syntax score, but it gives you a sense for, you know, sort of where the the, the landscape of risk. The, the challenge with it is that it's, you know, it was obviously calculated post hoc from a trial that for the PCI outcomes used a stent that's no longer available. And so, and quite frankly, was a stent that ended up being the control stent in all the other DES studies because the outcomes were so bad. So I'm not sure that it helps us in terms of, you know, uh, as much as we think it does. But I do think it's useful to it just for communication's sake, you know, if you say someone's got a syntax score of 32, everyone sort of knows what you're talking about. Um, so I think that's where the utility is. Um, I, you know, I, I've just got a little bit of a different view on this. It, it, if the syntax score was 35 plus, uh, I would be more prone to get a surgeon involved, at least in the discussion. Uh, but for me, I probably wouldn't get a surgeon involved in this discussion, even though I really understand the, the, the significant benefit you know, to having a second opinion and what bias interventionists may bring to the table. Um, but you know, oftentimes, if you consult a surgeon, you're, you're asking for surgery. And I just really don't think surgery is the right uh, right approach in this patient. In this patient, uh, if you were uh, if you would have been diabetic, I, I would have been a little bit more prone to go to surgery. If her syntax score was 35 or more, I would have more been uh, prone to surgery. Uh, depending on her lung status, uh, that would be a significant issue. If she had three vessel disease with the left main disease, 
uh, such that she had significant disease in the body of the cirque, the margin or the right coronary artery, I'd be more prone to surgery. But with a syntax score of 21, I, I would be way more pushed to basically, you know, going ahead and doing the intervention with some MCS in this patient rather than getting a surgical consultation. Yeah, this this is PCI all the way. I, I was, yeah. I was just, totally. so happy for us to do this. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, Herms, I, I guess just to push back a little bit, the experience I've had is a little bit like Louie's. You get a surgical consult and you get surgery, particularly when their volumes are going on down. So I'm curious if your surgeon looked at you and said, I understand she's got bad lungs, but I think I can get her through it. My question to you and the audience is how do you manage that situation? Yeah, um, anybody? Well, well you know, I think on. part of it, I do think that the surgeons could get her through the procedure. It's the recovery that's the whole issue. Wow. And with severe COPD and um, I don't know what her – she's overall frail, she's going to spend the rest of her life trying to recover from the operation. I think you have to applaud your surgeons for turning her down because that's the right thing to do. And I don't think we take into account the recovery of the patient well enough. And in this case, um, I would, I, if the surgeon said, yeah, we can get you through the operation, I'd tell the patient, that's not the end goal. It's trying to make you feel as well as you can for as long as you can. And I would, I think you should move ahead with PCI. Yeah. And I, I'm surprised, Dave. I, I don't think most surgeons, because they all need to have, you know, mortalities 1% or less, are going to want to jump on this because this is going to be not only trouble with uh, a long rehab, but, uh, you know, her mortality in house in the first 30 days is going to be high. That's right. So here are the procedural considerations, and it sounds like B and C have been answered uh, pretty well. Uh, uh, it sounds like uh, people are in favor of rotational. Uh, it sounds like uh, everyone would uh, think that MCS as an upfront strategy is a good idea. Transradial or transfemoral, guys? So Neil, you have to give the first. No, I think if you're going to use uh, an impella, the single access strategy is fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, Jason Wilmoth is the guy who sort of uh, has been disseminating a lot of that on social media and stuff and even published the paper on it. And, you know, for me, you know, I pay attention just like all of you do to vascular complications. You know, one is better than two. Uh, so if you can, if you're, if you're deciding to use impella, I would do what Yak said and just uh, go with that single access strategy through the impella sheath. I think that's really a terrific way to go. Um, Yaki, yeah, you wanna just explain uh, for the audience how you do that? So the, well, first of all, access is really key. And I think that um, we may have a little disagreement on this, but in our institution, if you're gonna go femoral, you better be using ultrasound and you have to know exactly where the femoral head is. And you have to make sure that your transfemoral puncture is at the right location with micropuncture. So that's number one. So, and then number two is we put in the impella sheath and there's one impella sheath that's 14 French and has an orange O-ring. You can poke that orange O-ring and put your sheath next to it once you've already delivered the impella device. And um, I would put a seven French sheath through that orange O-ring and then I would use a seven French guide to do this case because I do believe that you will need a 2 burr most, I'd be prepared to use a 2 burr to get adequate debulking of that distal left main into the LAD and then maybe even into the CERC. Can, can I ask the group a question? Um, I have routinely now, uh, if I don't have imaging of the femoral iliac system, I routinely do an angiogram. You know, I put a smaller sheet in, do an angiogram, make sure everything's copacetic before I will, you know, put the, put the large uh, impella sheath and is that standard of care for you guys or uh, I mean I just think it, I've, I've been bitten uh, not doing that and I think that's kind of important when you when you when you're getting these large bore access uh, procedures just to make sure you know you understand what the if there's tortuosity calcification stenosis I think it's good to know 
I think it's reasonable. I would. Yeah, do we do that. Course. We do that. I mean, that's why I mentioned the aortogram. I, I think you know what you want to do is you want to get a good result, but you also don't want to get called back in because the patient's got an ischemic leg, and now you got to stick the other side and attach the sheets and you know sort of get integrate perfusion. It just sort of becomes this big mess. So um, I think it's always good to to know what you're dealing with before you get in there. Yeah. Would and anyone have a different approach on access? Would anyone go transradial here? You know, uh, we, 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 we went transradial on this, and I'll explain that in more depth in a minute. But just to Ron's point, we also passed a pigtail catheter from the right radial site down to the distal abdominal aorta and took a picture before we employed MCS. Yeah, that's great. And, I, I, well, and you'll get into it, but uh, did you use a slender, a sheathless system, David? What, what 7.5 French sheathless PV3. Yeah. That's great. That's amazing. You know, some of these uh, vasculopathic older women have a hard time getting that big of a sheath. Uh, uh, Steve, we use this all the time, and it's not very often that we're doing our left main rotas from the groin anymore. Sunil has had such an impact on us. And you got me to admit that I would do this case from the leg. So maybe I'll just sign off now. I don't know. <laughs> and we've got this on record. This is fantastic. Wow. Maybe that's when we do the email blast. We'll say Sunil Rao abandons transradio. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the benefits from starting with the radio here and a routine cath is to assess what you have down below, which is, I think, what you did, Dr. Isaac. You know, oftentimes you end up with a sheath in the femoral, at least in my opinion, and you're putting seven to 10 cc's in, you're going LAO, you're going AP, you're not sure where you are, you know, you've already killed 20 to 30 cc's of contrast and you've never really gotten into the common femoral artery or the bifurcation. So uh, I really prefer an aortogram to do a, you know, 10, 20 cc skirt uh, somewhere rather than uh, putzing around with the sheath. Yeah. All right. So I think we got to the what next part. So a couple of things, we did employ MCS. We went, we accessed transradial first. As I said, we did uh, an aortogram and looked at the, uh, the right iliofemoral system. It looked satisfactory for MCS. Um, we used the CP device. The, uh, I, we wouldn't think about doing this kind of case without ultrasound. We were actually able to squeak uh, an ultrasound catheter through wow. the, you see the MLA, you see the LVEDP. On the original cath, we did float a swan, uh, elevated PAD around 20, give or take change. Um, we used a 14 French cook sheath uh, to place the impella. We actually did this case before they had the, the, the new sheath that you can remove and replace. And the upfront strategy was the IVIS uh, guided DK crush uh, strategy. Now, David Cox and I just got off another uh, SIF virtual session. And in it, uh, one of the operators uh, said that, you know, he didn't think that the DK crush was the beginning and the end. And if you did a, um, if you did a, uh, um, uh, a good tap or a good culotte, that that was just as good. What do you guys think? Who wants to weigh in? I will. You know, I think that there are multiple ways to do this, and it all depends on the angle that the vessel is taking off. I do think that tap is the most difficult to make sure that all parts of the vessels are covered adequately. There is a little bit of data that says the DK crush might be better for left main. That's kind of questionable. However, I think that any strategy that you are most comfortable with is probably the best strategy. And I would personally consider DK crush to be the best strategy in this particular case. However, I just wanted to ask one other question. Why did you do the ultrasound first? Um. I, I know we didn't need the ultrasound data. I wanted to see how bulky and how extensive the calcium was extending into both vessels. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, we were able to do the ultrasound. So I did. I, I tend, uh, Steve, to uh, use ultrasound, not just for sizing, 
but to determine bulkiness, circumferential calcium versus non-circumferential calcium. I can see angiographically that it looks pretty serious, uh, but that was the reason I used it. So um, this is our uh, impella. This is the uh, uh, one of the working views we uh, utilized. Uh, Herms, I think you're right. I think rotoing into the LAD first uh, was the right thing to do. Uh, you can see the intravascular ultrasound images and the calcium. I think that uh, those uh, IVUS images are, are helpful. Uh, we rotated the uh, LAD uh, first and then rotated the CERC. Um, you go then, one, did you go one uh, five uh, or one seven five, one, one five? We used a one five and to Steve's point, we went up to a one seven five. Okay. And you decided DK crush, which I think, you know, um, I, I, th I think you do what you're best at. Um, and if you can do a really good DK crush, that's a great uh, choice here. You know, Herms, I I'll tell you that I understand why some people say, uh, you know, I don't like the DK crush. I'm really good at culotte. I'm very comfortable with it. And I can remember the steps. There, there are some people that just can't remember. I mean, sometimes you got to make a list of next steps on the DK crush. Uh, it is a lot to remember. And there's a couple of, I, I tend to speak to individuals and they say, oh, there's a couple of versions of it. I'd be curious what the, what the group thinks of that. Yeah. Anybody want to comment? Well, they keep adding steps too. Yeah, um, right. You know, they, they throw a couple of proximal optimizations in there, and you know, and so you know, I think DK Crush is the board answer. I mean, it's uh, it, it's clearly the one that has the most data. I think the challenge with the DK Crush data is that it seems to be limited to a very very talented group of operators that do it a lot, and um, you know, the the uh, plural of anecdote is not data, but. We have seen several DK crushes done that uh, in the community that come back to us with a really man-eating restenosis because you know people are not used to doing it that well. They just aren't comfortable with doing it. And I think one of the other challenges is that it's a strategy that ends up with a little more metal in the, in the carina, and yet you seem to have less stent thrombosis. So I've never sort of been able to get my mind around that. How do you have more stent and less stent thrombosis? Maybe it's just the fact that these operators are so good, they're really able to expand the stents well. Sunil, Greg said uh, recently on a, on a conference uh, Dave Cox and I were on that uh, it's been done in, 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 in China. It, the data has never been really reproduced on the European or the American continent. And some people that uh, fail to adopt that would uh, do so because they would like to see, see it reproduced. Uh, true, not true? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think uh, the challenge with us trying to reproduce it in the U.S. is that we don't really have any large data sets that capture the level of detail that you would need to actually uh, understand a technique like this in American hands, unfortunately. It, it really isn't that hard. It's just a step crush with an extra kiss in there. But to, um, and I think uh, basically it's better than a simple mini crush for most people because it's easier to get back in for the final kiss. You're not going through, you know, three layers. You're just getting through basically uh, two layers uh, at the end. There are just uh, one layer. So to me, that's it. It's all about, you know, optimizing the thing. And you can, I think, better do that. Um, but um I'm with everybody. It's better clearly in China, but we haven't reproduced it anywhere else. Do, do you guys, does vessel size uh, enter into the decision algorithm when you're thinking about culotte versus crush? I mean, sometimes I think with bigger vessels, you know, how, how big are you gonna get that stent cell? You know, at the end of the day, how much are you gonna deform that initial stent with culotte? So, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. I'm just. Yeah, I would just, I would say just one thing, Ron, I don't like doing culotte when there's a big disparity in vessel sizes, yeah. you, you know, a small, you got a two, five diagonal and a three, five LED. I don't yeah. like it. There. It's better for DK crush. Um, you know, there is some on the table bench stops uh, stuff that Ormondson's done that, uh, you know, the DK crush for that reason that you just said looks better than a culotte. So Dave, Risa, can I ask a question? In our previous webinar, you, I guess what my question is, we have data for left main, as Sunil was pointed out, that data is in the hands of 
really high volume left main operators of which none exist in the United States. Um, how about for non left main bifurcation lesions? Can we really say that DK crush has any advantage? Yeah, there, there's, there's data uh, versus culotte and versus provisional in main and non left main. I, you know, there's uh, ACC 2013, the left main data was presented, but also presented was the non-left main data. And Kulat tends to, or I'm sorry, DK Crush tends to be, uh, uh, have better data compared to provisional and compared to Kulat. Um, is Sunil or anybody else want to comment? Louis? I, I, you know, for me, Dave, the, the big take home of this is there's a lot of different ways to do it, do what you're comfortable with. But I think an important message uh, for the operators out there is to try to end with kissing balloons. You know, don't allow yourself to go in one artery or the other and snow plow back and forth. Really try to end with kissing balloons in both vessels if you can. And, and I think that's a little bit of protection, regardless of what you use. And I would, even, I would even extend that and say, you want to do a sort of a two-step kiss that you go high pressure, high pressure, yeah, and a kiss. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, you can consider whether you want to pop them and make it sort of round at the end proximally or not. But uh, yeah. I, I don't think completely. Well, so what we did is to put a 4-0 DES in the circ, used a balloon as a uh, sort of a backstop uh, for, uh, you know, went through the, the DK crush uh as it was at the time that we did this procedure, put a 4-0 in the uh, left main to LAD, potted it, as you can see, and did a final uh, kiss, um, and then did another ultrasound run, and everything looked like it was maximally dilated, well opposed, good expansion. And this is in the one of the caudal angulations, what the final... Uh, what the final result is like. Um, and here it is in another angulation. And there you see the post uh, PCI uh, left main uh, IVUS. Uh, anything that anyone would have done differently up till now. Beautiful job. We did the mid LA, LAD, David. Yes, we did the mid LAD. Good question. Dave, it's like you're my, uh, my Ed McMahon. Uh, we did the mid LAD, uh, didn't do anything to the diag just stented across it, and that was the final result. And that was also uh, IVUS, uh, IVUS guided. So that was our final result of both the left main and the LAD. And then following per close and pre close fashion, here's our final angiogram after we removed our 14 French sheath uh, from the right. Uh, looks okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, patient did well afterwards and uh, we got the patient out of the hospital in uh, in a couple of days. Uh, any any questions or any different approach that people would take? Yeah, David, that's a that's a really nice case. Uh, I mean, that was really gorgeous in terms of everything that you, you did there and how it turned out. How much contrast did you end up using? I think her yeah. expansion was like one point three to begin with. Yeah. As we, recall. We, we used one hundred and ten cc's of contrast. What we did is. We admitted the patient. We did prehydration and intraprocedural hydration. You know, we talk about uh, all the different uh, cocktails uh, that can be given uh, for uh, prophylaxis against CIN. For me, it's still saline. Uh, bolus before and a bolus during. And this patient actually did very well. Uh, and we avoided contrast induced nephropathy. We used just over 100 cc's, though. You know, I, I didn't see, at least in the floral, any pictures that you had a swan in her right heart calf. Do, do you utilize the the wedge pressures when you're hydrating like that within the EF 35 We didn't, and that might have been another way to do it. We were pretty confident, though, that uh, we weren't going to uh, overhydrate her. We did have a swan in weeks before, uh, tuned her when we did the initial diagnostic case, tuned her up, um, and then... Uh, uh, after she, we, she was maximally tuned, that's when we readmitted her electively for this. But I think putting a swan in now in retrospect would have been a really good idea. Yeah, you got the impeller. <clears throat> I mean, that, that'll give you some help. Some help there. It's a beautiful result. Looks fantastic. What's your uh, antiplatelet therapy regimen and how long are you going to treat her for? This was two years ago and she's still on DAPT. She's tolerating it. 
She's not having problems with it. Uh, you know, I'm sure we can take her off now, but the last time I saw her was just before, uh, you know, just before Christmas 2019. And she was tolerating depth and I was happy to leave her on it. Would, would someone else, would you guys do something different? Tom, what would you do? Oh, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's really quite reasonable. You know, her GI bleed was much, much earlier. Uh, it doesn't sound like she currently has high bleeding risk. So as long as she's doing well with the, with the complexity of the, of the, uh, uh, the intervention that you did, I, I would, I would be inclined to, you know, to, to leave her on it. If she had any evidence of uh, bleeding, you know, one option would be to see if she's, you know, clopidogrel responsive, and then you could drop the aspirin. Uh, but I, I, I think what you've done has been great. Yeah. Let me ask you, and it's one thing that always comes up with these bifurcation cases and DK crush or just two stent cases is, hey, I'm trying to get across to do my final kiss. I can't either, you know, get a wire across or I can't get a balloon across or what sort of tricks uh, of the trade do you use, uh, Dave Cox or anybody? I can't get the wire back through there to get into the diagonal branch. Uh, any tricks to do that? And then to, what balloon do you use if you can't get in? And, and, and well, how do you problem solve there? Yes, yeah, so I'll be real quick. I sometimes I'll just pull my main artery wire back. I seem to have a bit more luck doing, doing that. And then you're the one that taught me this, Jim. Um, just use a smaller balloon. I think everybody tries to get a two five across and sometimes you need a one, two five. I, I can tell you what happens out in the community. You just don't do it. Uh, I mean, if, if people have any trouble, they sort of abandon ship. And I still think we need to get that message out there and that message across that you gotta persist. Guys, anybody else have any tricks? Yeah, the, the only thing I do, I, I'm probably more in a community hospital than, than uh, you guys, is uh, if you put down an over-the-wire balloon, like a 2.0 balloon, and you uh, change the configuration of the wire to like a very sharp 90 degrees, something that's going to be hard, you kind of move the balloon back and forth as you're probing with the wire. Uh, sometimes you can get the wire down and then bring your balloon through there and then go back to a regular wire if you need to. But, but uh, utilizing that balloon to change the wire configuration and putting it back in through there can really help you get through 90 degree or reverse angle bends. What if you get your wire through, but you can't get your balloon through, then what? Um, I, I would go with a 1.5 balloon. Uh, and then obviously if you need, uh, you know, some type of backup with a crosser or something like that, then I would use that. But, but I've got no hesitation to go into a 1.5 balloon if I need to. Anybody use a glider? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. I mean, we've, uh, you know, the glider balloon has got the wedge like tip to it and, and it's sort of designed specifically to try to get into side branches. And, but I think, you know, as Louis said, and, uh, you know, if you, you go, if you go with a smaller balloon, uh, sometimes you don't really even need to pull the glider. Yeah. The other, the other thing you can do is, you know, you've got a wire, let's say it's an LED diagonal and you've got, you've already stented both and you've got the wire still uh, down the uh, LED, put a balloon in there, blow it up and lock your that'll help lock your guide and everything and drive your drive your balloon into the side branch and that that is very simple and works i think this dave's thing. point is is important though because i think there are lots of things that do happen where people can't cross the balloon they either don't do it or they cross with a one five or they cross with a two oh and they say uh, okay well you know i kiss balloons um and, and you know i think it's important that if you are going to kiss balloons you got to go one to one um, on both branches, because I think Colombo wrote a great editorial years ago, uh, right, that he titled a kiss is not just a kiss. Um, and it's important to adequately size that final kissing balloon inflation. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question, Herms. Yeah. Uh, you're, uh, you're in a program where you're a first year attending. Okay. This is your first year. Um, and you've had lots of great experience in your a fellowship doing complex PCI, but you're confronted with this. We have a lot of fellows, uh, a lot of the SIF fellows uh, tune into SIF virtual. Well, what's your what's your recommendation? You do a great talk on first year, uh, you know, in practice. What's your uh, what's your recommendation to a first year attending, Herms? 
Yeah. So, so I was just say, you know, your first year, your denominators very small and anything you put in the numerator is going to make for a high percentage. So be very careful. In this case, what I would do is get one of your um, elderly, more experienced partners to scrub the case and, you know, uh, spread the blame um, if something goes bad. And, you know, as long as, you know, you've discussed it with them and they're on board and, you know, they even scrub in with you, you're safe. And, you'll, you know, you've had the experience as a fellow, you know how to do it. It's just, you know, this case could go south and you don't want to be, uh, you know, looking behind you and there's nobody around. The other thing to add to that, Jim, and that's a really good point, is don't wait for arrest. Get me in there beforehand. Um, so when you're starting to get uh, in trouble, you know, have that senior guy there. The senior guy can easily take the hit. They've done five, 10,000, 20,000 cases, and they may actually have a way in or a way out of trouble for you. So don't feel like uh, you're an attending now and you got to do this all yourself and be strong because it's, it's okay to say, you know, uh, that I need help. Uh, help is the first step in actually getting help. So you've really got to ask for it. Don't be afraid to do that. Yeah, and I think I think um, your attendings will respect you more by doing it that way. You know, you'll 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 have good clinical sense, and and I think this kind of case, get them to scrub it with you. You know, they're going to get the RVUs, but um, you know, you, you're on safe territory. This was great, Herms. What a great uh, discussion! That was a fantastic case. I mean, we we could talk all day about this. What does Squad Two think about doing this again soon? Love it. Uh, absolutely. But I'm going to say radial the next time, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> We've already got you on. Hey, we're going to show a Taver case. <laughs> Pistol radial Taver. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Thanks, I Dave. Wanna, Great case. Thank you, Steve. I want to yeah. thank each of you uh, for taking the time out to, uh, to join us for this interactive case review for SIF Virtual. Um, and we look forward to the next time uh, that we all get together. Thank you very much.